Uh, okay, welcome everybody. It's great to see uh, you all here today. Um, I hope you're enjoying the. Are you enjoying this series? The way I, I am really enjoying it. I'm learning so much from it. Um, don't forget, uh, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. If you haven't yet organized yourself, I'm reliably informed there's some Sunny Hill pens at the back of the <laughs> desk there, which you can just grab for free. It's a win all round. There you go, my darling. Love you. Uh, there's also a great book, which I think is very cheap as well. So... Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember last year, Fro, Fru woke up on Valentine's Day morning and uh, she, she said to me, I've had a dream that you gave me a, an expensive, beautiful diamond necklace. <laughs> and she said, what do you think it means? <laughs> and I was, obviously had to think on my feet, so I said, oh, well, you'll find out later. So I, I went shopping that day, I got the gift, and I brought it, wrapped it, brought it home, and you should have seen the excitement in her eyes when I said, well, now you'll find out what your dream means, and I handed her the gift. And she opened the gift. She was a little less excited when she realized it was a book, now discover what your dreams mean. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, this year, I've bought her a, a bag and a matching belt, so hopefully the hoover will work better now. Uh, <laughs> they don't get any better, do they? <laughs> they really don't. Uh, anyway, we've been looking, uh, uh, we've been in this series, The Way, we've been looking at what it means to follow uh, the way of Jesus in a world that rejects and actually sometimes even hates the very idea that there is a single way to salvation or, or, or a way to God. Uh, we've been looking at what it means to obey the truth of Jesus, the, the truth of scripture, the truth of the word, in a world uh, that, um, that insists that everybody can kind of create their own truth and decide what truth they want to believe. We've been looking at what it means to live Life, the what we call Zoe life, we talked a little bit about that last week. Life in all its fullness, the life that God promise, promises us, the, the eternal life, the, the life of freedom and peace and joy and hope. We've been learning to, uh, to, you know, what it means to live this life in a world that promotes the idea that life and freedom is actually living according to your own kind of selfish desires. And we've kind of been spinning those things on their head. Okay, well, that's what the world's way is. What is the way of Jesus? What is the Jesus followers' way? Jesus said that he is the way and the truth and the life. And in fact, in that statement, he was, he was saying he alone is the way and the truth and the life. We don't get to add him to our own personal uh, pick and mix of religious ideas and philosophies. Oh, I'll have a bit of Jesus and a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other and mix it all together and create something that I'm comfortable with. Okay, Jesus never gave, gave us that option. We either, actually, this week, I remind you, I was thinking about a song that I used to sing in Sunday school. I know my mum will remember it, but I don't know if any of you knew it. I met Jesus at the crossroads. Yeah, I knew she'd remember it. <laughs> she probably taught it to me. Yeah, um, I met Jesus at the crossroads where the two ways meet. Satan, he was standing there and he said, come this way, lots and lots of pleasure I will give to you today. But I said, no, there's Jesus here, see what he offers me. Down here, my sins forgiven. Up there, a home in heaven. Praise God, that's the way for me. <laughs> we used to sing that in Sunday school. But it's right, it's a great picture of this world. In every, every day, we, we kind of come to this crossroads where we have a choice. Do we follow the world's way or my selfish human way or the devil's way? Or do I follow the way of Jesus? And that choice is there. And so the choice that we actually have is... Uh, we, can't make, we can't add Jesus to our own pick and mix. We either have to accept him fully or reject him. That's our only choice. And if we accept him, if we say, yes, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, I'm going to follow Jesus' way, what then? Well, then we get to live the way. We get to live out the way. We get to let go of the need to gratify our own human desires, which are actually enslaving us. They're not bringing us freedom at all. And we bring our own desires under his, under his rule, under his lordship. 
And we accept the help of the Holy Spirit inside of us who will shine a light on those areas where we're perhaps not doing as well as we might. And he will also give us the power to overcome those areas. Holy Spirit's great. He points out the things that we're not doing quite well in. And then he helps us to, to put those things right. And gradually over time we're recreated into the image of Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus, which is really what our goal is. So what stops us? What stops us from, from doing this, from pursuing the way? Pre- what prevents us from accepting and living the way? So that I want to talk about what I think is probably the biggest barrier to us accepting and living out the way. And it's the, the, the thing that I think is the biggest barrier is fear. Fear. And this is a, a, a word that I've had on my heart for this church for a couple of months. In fact, the whole series was going to be about, about this before, before we changed it. But I've really been thinking about this idea of fear, particularly coming out of this season of COVID and lockdowns and looking at the news and looking at the world and looking at my neighbours and speaking to people. There's a lot of fear in the world. And and it feels like, actually, I think the Bible and Jesus and the way has something to say about that. So I want us to unpack this idea of fear, what it is, how it works, what the Bible says about it, and how we can find um, a way through it. There There it is. The way through fear. So first of all, a definition, so that we're all operating from the same page. Fear. Uh, I got this from a dictionary, an online dictionary, which said it's an an unpleasant and often strong emotion caused by anticipation of a real or imagined danger. So the first thing we see is that fear is uh, an emotion. It's an emotion. It's a feeling uh, that, that is caused by a sense of danger towards us. It can be danger that we feel about us or danger towards those we love. Okay, people we care about, we can feel fear on their behalf. Uh, and that fear, and that danger, sorry, can be real danger or it can be an imagined danger. It doesn't have to be a, an actual real danger. It can be just something that's in our heads. It will still cause the same emotion of fear that's in, in, inside us. And fear is something that we all have the capacity to feel and all sorts of things can make fear rise inside of us. We, we just sang, didn't we? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Um, there's plenty of things in the world that are scary and dangerous. Right? Even before COVID hit the scene, there were things in the world that were dangerous. Right? That could cause, that could cause fear. And if, everybody, anybody, sorry, if anybody ever says that they don't feel any fear, then there's three possibilities. One, they're just lying, okay? They're just not telling the truth. Uh, uh, Two, the second possibility is that they are too stupid to recognize danger. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember the, um, do you remember Johnny English, the movie? The poster for Johnny English said, he knows no fear, he knows no danger, he knows nothing, yeah? Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's a bit like a, when, when I was a teenage boy, and I don't know if you, teenage boys go through this period where they don't see the danger in things, and they, they try all sorts of things, and they think they're invincible. Um, they're just too stupid to recognize danger. So, either lying or too stupid, or the third possibility is, if you're somebody who says, oh, I don't ever feel fear, the possibility is you're, you're living a really small life. You're not living the life that you were created to live. Because if you were, then I think actually you would feel fear. If, if you stay inside the zone of your comfort, then your life just isn't big enough. I don't know if you think about Joshua in the Bible. He's a great, he's one of the heroes of faith, isn't he? Joshua, he's the guy who took over from Moses and he was the one who led the nation of Israel from the desert into the promised land. What a great guy. We never think of him as somebody who was afraid. But he was. He was somebody who felt fear. He went into battle after battle after battle. But really, he was somebody who was filled with fear. Let me explain what I mean. Right at the beginning of the book of Joshua, when God is commissioning him to to lead the the nation and to take them forward into Canaan, uh, God says this to Joshua. He says, have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And who do you say don't be afraid to? You say it to people who are afraid. Uh, but this isn't the only time. This is Joshua 1. But if you kind of look through uh, the next few chapters, Joshua 8 verse 1, Joshua 10 verse 8, Joshua 11 verse 6, he says exactly the same thing. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Every time Joshua had to face a new battle, a new enemy, a new, a new nation that he had to overcome, the same thing. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Have courage. Have courage. Do not be afraid. God was telling him again and again. Why did God say this to Joshua? Because he was afraid and discouraged. Because that's what we say to people who are afraid. What was Joshua afraid of? Well, he was about to go into battle. People with with sticks and swords and knives and axes and shields and things that were going to be aiming to hurt him. He was afraid of being hurt or even killed. Or maybe he was afraid of, of stepping into Moses' shoes, of not leading the children of Israel well. Money with big shoes to fill, wasn't it? But whatever the fears, the dangers were real. The dangers that he was facing were real. And the truth is, I don't think he went into any of these battles without any fear. Even though God said to him, don't be afraid, I don't think actually God was saying that you won't have fear inside you. To say to somebody, don't be afraid, instead have courage, they're two different concepts. Let me explain what I mean, because courage and fear, they're not opposite. They are not connected like that. You don't lay aside fear and pick up courage and everything is easy and wonderful it's not a scale with with fear here and courage here and you really try and move yourself along this scale until you get to courage fear is an emotion courage is not an emotion courage is a decision you might notice that God says be strong and courageous he doesn't say feel strong and courageous he says, be, this is something you've got to be. This is something you've got to choose. This is something you've got to decide to do. There's another movie with another great tagline. There's a film called After Earth with Will Smith. And in this film, he fights aliens. Um, and aliens, they can't see. The only way they can sense you is through fear. And the, the tagline on the poster for After Earth is, danger is very real, fear is a choice. It's a great line. It's, it's completely rubbish, um, but it's, 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 that's the line. Uh, fear isn't a choice, by the way. Fear is an emotional response to a perceived danger. If danger is there, we should feel fear. What the poster should have read was, danger is very real. Acting from your fear is a choice. Acting out of fear. Because what is a choice is whether we allow fear to control our actions or we choose the path of courage but choosing the path of courage doesn't mean that we no longer feel fear we know it doesn't mean that we don't long feel, feel the same way it means we're not letting the fear determine the direction and decisions of our life I heard this uh, great quote it was this when you live by fear you feel fear get this okay when you live by courage you feel Fear. You didn't see that coming, did you? And let me say it again. When you live by fear, you feel fear. When you live by courage, you feel fear. The feeling's the same. But it's whether you decide to live from a, from a uh, perspective of fear or live from a, perspective, from a decision, a perspective of courage. About what in your life is God saying to you? Have courage. Be courageous. Don't be discouraged. So what fears, what fears do you live with? Fears maybe about your family, that your kids won't turn out the way you want them to turn out? Yeah? Maybe you, your fears that your friends or your husband or your wife won't, um, or they might reject you if they knew what was going on inside you really, what you were really like, or that you're not smart enough, fear that you're not talented enough, fear that you're um, not strong enough. Fear that you're not in control. The space between the life that I'm living now, the life we're living, 
and the life that we want to live is often filled with fear. Is often filled with that emotion. The space between me and my dreams, again, is a space occupied by fear. The, 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 the space between uh, me and my God-given purposes is often a space filled by fear. It's like, let me put it this way, if you're standing on a beach, kind of looking across a great ocean, and in the distance you see a land, just all the way over there, and you think, yes, that's where I want to get to. That's my dreams, that's my God-given purpose, that's what God's talking to me about, that's the life that I want to live all the way over there. And that ocean between you is filled with your fears. Fear of failure. If, if I try this, will I succeed or will I fail? Fear of ridicule. If I go that way, what will my friends think about me? Fear of losing my reputation. What will people think of me if I step out in that way? I heard something interesting a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, your reputation is, what, is who people think you are. Your character is who you actually are. Fear of missing out, FOMO. This is a particularly millennial thing, isn't it? If I step out and head over there, what if I miss something better over there? Or what if there's something back here that I wish I'd had done? Or what if people are there are happier, or people there are happier? If I go over there, I'm gonna fear I'm gonna miss out on something better. Fear of my dreams not living up to my expectations. Fear of what this will do to my family and those around me. Fear of letting go of where I am now. Even though I know that that's better, this is familiar. And so some, sometimes you just feel like I just want to stay what, we're in a place that's familiar. Fear of success. Fear of how others will view you when you start moving on. You've heard the saying, misery loves company. You know what's true? Dysfunction loves company as well. And, and the people that we've gathered around us um, can often have the same fears that we do. And if we to start break out of that, then maybe we're worried about what they will think about what we're doing. I don't know if you've ever uh, seen this where there's a, an addict who's got you know, uh, some kind of addiction and he hangs around with other addicts. If he breaks out of his addiction... There's a sense that all these other people who he leaves behind start to antagonize him because it, misery loves company, you know? And who are you to, to step out of, of this? I don't know if you've ever seen the, um, I know I'm doing a lot of movies today, but sorry about this, uh, movie Coach Carter. I think it's a, it's a classic movie about a, a high school basketball coach. It's a sporting film. You know those sporting films where you've got the team, the underdog who you follow, and at the beginning of the movie they play the best team in the league and they get thrashed, and then by the end of the film they've worked through it, through it all, and at the end of the film they play the best team again and it's a championship game and they win. That's not this film. They do play the best team again, but they lose again, okay? Which thinks, well, why would I want to watch that? But actually, the point of the film is this coach, it's a true story about a coach who goes into this, uh, this high school, and he's trying to get his, uh, his, uh, his students to live bigger and better lives, not just on the court, in their lives as well. And he keeps asking them this question. He keeps talking to, his, to, the, to the players, and he keeps saying, what is your deepest fear? What is your deepest fear? And, and throughout the film, the, the players kind of look at each other. Why does coach keep asking us what our deepest fear is? And then it gets to the end of the film, or towards the end of the film, as a breakthrough moment where the students, they finally start to trust the coach. And one of them quotes this poem by uh, Marianne Williamson, he says, who says, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. Not just in some of us, in all of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates 
others. And so we've got these two extremes. You've got, you know, this, the place we want to get to over here, and then between it is the fear of failure or even the fear of success. And both will hold us back from crossing that ocean to the plans and purposes of God. And the fears won't just dissipate. They won't just go away with a quick prayer or by giving yourself a talking to. What we need is courage. Courage. Courage is the boat that will get us across that ocean. God said to Joshua, have I not commanded you? He didn't say, have I not suggested? Have I not recommended? He didn't, he said, have I not commanded you? He made it a command. Don't live in fear. Live from a place of courage. Beware of someone who says you can bypass fear. You can go around it. You can have a smaller dream, a more accessible dream, a, a different purpose. That's not the way of the kingdom at all. You know the parable of the talents. I'm sure we all do. It's a really well-known uh, story that Jesus tells about a master who goes away and he entrusts, he entrusts a, a, a portion of gold to his three servants. And two of the servants, the master goes away, two of the servants put the gold to work and the third uh, servant, he buries the gold in the ground. And then the master comes back and he commends the first two because the gold that he gave them has grown. But the third servant, he makes his excuses and he said, I knew that you are a hard man, so I was, I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. I didn't invest it. I didn't develop it. I didn't use what you'd given me. I didn't grow it. I didn't do anything with it. I buried it because I was afraid. I was filled with fear. And I let my fear dictate my actions. And I think the question here is, do you not think the first two servants also knew the master? They were also afraid. They knew what the master was like. They knew that the master was going to come back. And there would be judgment but they didn't stay in that place of fear. They acted out of courage and they invested it and they got commended for it. And at the end of the parable, the master throws the, the, is what he calls the wicked servant into darkness where Jesus says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I don't know about you, but when you kind of picture this, I've always had this image in my mind of, of that servant lying on some kind of torture rack uh, with a demon or something next to him with a lever laughing maniacally turning this lever and giving him pain and that's why he's weeping and gnashing his teeth but I don't think actually thinking about it, I don't think that's what it is at all actually I think the gnashing of teeth it speaks of regret it speaks of a an infinite and eternal regret at what could have been and should have been that's what living from a place of fear brings it brings regret whether we make excuses for what we've done, the root of what we've done, what, the root of our fear, the root of the thing that causes regret is pretty much always fear. The reason I didn't do it, whether we're prepared to admit it or not, is usually fear. At the beginning of uh, uh, last month in January, my son JJ, I know most of you know him, he's, he's 20, he's 20 now, yeah. Um, he went on a camping trip to the Lake District. So right at the beginning of January, he was he, 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 with a friend of his, they decided to do wild camping. Now wild camping is, you've got a tent, you've got a sleeping bag, but you, you kind of live off the land, you know? You kind of cook for yourself, you, you toilet in the bushes, you drink the water from the river, it's kind of wild camping. You don't take any of your mod cons with you. Anyway, they left very early in the morning because they had a long way to drive. Um, and then when I came downstairs, around, I don't know what time it was, maybe uh, seven o'clock or something, and I saw that the tent that they were taking was in the hallway. <laughs> I was like, yeah, wild. Um, so, I, so I immediately phoned JJ not so wild that he didn't have his phone. I phoned JJ and said, JJ, your tent is here. He said, oh, don't worry, we took a different one. I said, oh, that's great, phew, thank goodness. So he'd taken a different tent, I put the phone in, I didn't think any more of it. Until later in that day, when I suddenly thought, well, which tent did they take then? And I went into the shed to check where we've got our tents, and I realized they'd taken our kiddies' summer play tent. <laughs> 
to the Lake District <laughs> in January. I was like, oh no. And a little, I have to admit, a little bit of fear just came into my, came into my heart right then. And then that night, I was, I was lying in bed. And I, I thought, I'll just look at what the weather is like in the Lake District. <laughs> so I clicked on the weather app. Snow, minus four degrees. Oh, I'm thinking, oh no. A little bit of fear came into my heart again. And then I started thinking about JJ. And he's, he's, he's got half a heart. He had a... He's got a heart condition, so he's only got half, and he gets cold, and his lips go blue, and he's, it's not good for him to be cold. And a little bit of fear came into my heart again. And then I read the news. And on the news, that very night, no word of a lie, it's, uh, it was talking about how lots of people in the Lake District had died or had to be rescued because they hadn't gone prepared properly. <laughs> Literally that night. Oh, no, and so, again, a bit more fear came in. I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was thinking all night. And I wasn't thinking so much about, uh, about, about JJ. I was thinking about my own inadequacy. I was thinking, oh, I haven't prepared him well enough. He shouldn't be doing this. I haven't done enough to prepare him for life. I'm not enough. And I called him the next morning, and he was fine. He was freezing cold, and he was wet. Um, but it was okay, and I'd lost this light night's sleep and feared for no reason. And do you know what the source of my fear was, I realized? It wasn't the tent, it wasn't the weather, it wasn't the news, it wasn't JJ's heart. It was me. Whatever you're afraid of is not actually the source of your fear. The fear, source of your fear is you. It's your imagination. It can be anything that we put fears on. We put fears onto spiders and the dark and, and other things. And actually, it's just us. And over the last couple of years, living through this uh, COVID pandemic, fear has gripped so many people. The fear of death, of getting sick, or of a loved one, or elderly parents, or of someone getting ill with COVID. There's been a lot more fear around. And then at the other extreme, you've got this other group of people who are not afraid of COVID at all um, because COVID is just a conspiracy by a government or by big tech or by the media. Uh, and they sneer at those who live in fear of, of the virus. But the truth is, they themselves are living in just as much fear, but fear of conspiracy, fear of government, fear of media, fear of big tech. There's fear on both sides of the argument. And people who are afraid of COVID use science and data and research to confirm their fears. And people who are afraid of, of conspiracy and government and media use data and research and science to confirm their fears. And there's just all this, remember we talked about the first week, confirmation bias is going on all over the place. People search for the thing that's going to confirm what they already think. And it just confirms what they already think. Surprise, surprise. And then their fears get bigger. And you know what? Both camps might be right. There may be things to be fearful about in COVID. It may be a good idea to not get it. It may be a good idea to wear masks and, and not spread it. Particularly if you're old and vulnerable. And it may be that the media or big tech or, or those pharmaceutical companies do have an agenda. And they're trying to exaggerate the risks for their own ends. That may well be true as well. Particularly in the media, you know there's a cultural narrative that's trying to get us to be afraid all the time. You just have to look at the news, it's all designed to fill us with fear because nothing sells like fear. The more fearful they can get you, kind of the more money they're making because they're selling the space to advertising, you know? It does them well and they know that good news doesn't sell like fear does. And maybe there are things that we need to work out. Maybe we need to budget better. Because if they're, try they're trying to get us to be afraid of, of government, of Russian aggression, of rising fuel prices, of the cost of living. And maybe we do need to pay attention to some of these things. But we do it for the right reasons. We don't want to live out of fear. We want to live lives of courage. We make decisions from a place of courage. We don't want to let fear rob us of moving into God's best for us and God's will for us. And maybe 
you're sat there and, you, and you've had this thought or God's given you a plan or a dream or a vision or a purpose and you think oh, well, I'll, I'll really know it's God's will for me when I don't feel fear anymore I don't think that's true I think we just, if we read our Bible, everybody who was called by God to do anything of any significance went through this place of fear. They had courage as well and they stepped out in courage. If it doesn't make you afraid, then I wonder if it's actually God's will anyway. You know, I think God's will is always moving us to put on a bigger jacket. He always wants us to do things that require more than the resources that we have. And if you're waiting for that ocean that's in front of you to part like the Red Sea, so you can walk through without getting wet, I think you may be waiting for a while. Even though we just sang it, didn't we just sang it in the song, you split the sea so I could walk right through it? You know what, guess what? I think God sometimes does do that, but I think more often than that, it's more like the, the picture of the River Jordan where they stood in front of the river and they had to take the step into the river before the flow stopped coming, before they could move across. They had to make the step to flow into this river that was coming at them. It didn't part before they moved. And I think more often than not, life is more like that. We have to make a decision to step into the thing we're afraid of before we see a way through it. And if you're waiting to have all the necessary resources before you take a step towards where you think God wants you to be, I, I think that's not how it works. I think it's in the deep waters that we, that we learn to swim and it's in the troubles and the challenges that we learn that God is with us in the fire. He's with us in the water. When those battles come, that's why we can find joy. And if, the, if your dreams are the same size as your talent and your resources, then your dreams aren't big enough. And if you're waiting to grow your resources to the size of your dreams, then your dreams aren't big enough. We don't want to be waiting. We want to move in courage. I'm just about done for this morning, but actually it's not the end of the message. Because like I said at the beginning, courage isn't the antidote to fear. They're not opposites, but there is something that is an antidote to fear. And we read it in uh, 1 John 4 verse 18. He says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. It turns out that the scale, the, the spectrum, is not fear and courage, but it's fear and love. Not just love, perfect love. And the more that we allow ourselves to be controlled by love, by perfect love, the less we're going to be controlled by fear. So what we're going to do, we're going to continue this conversation next week and see how the way of love fits into this idea of making us courageous to be able to step through our fear. Remember I called this message a way through fear, not a way around it or a way over it, but a way through it. We're going to continue this next week. But for today... Um, let's stand together. I'm just going to pray and then we're going to finish. But today, I don't know what God has laid on your heart at the moment, whether there are things that you think you should be doing or that you might be doing or that God has given you plans and purposes and a vision for. I was reading in my Bible reading today, Acts 2, uh, which quotes from um, the uh, uh, prophet uh, Joel, when he says, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall have visions. That cats, that's everybody. That's all, all of us, dreams and visions. We should all be having dreams and visions. Okay, that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. That happened on the day of Pentecost. And I wonder what dream or vision God is planting on your heart in this season of life. And maybe you've been waiting for the fear to go before you step into that. And perhaps God today is saying, no, no, no. It's time. It's time to step out. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Don't be discouraged. Move forward. Yes, you don't need resources or talent. You need courage. God is big enough. God is big enough to help you into the, the plans and purposes that he's given you. 
So I'm just going to pray. And if you know that you want to do this, that you want to step into a, a life of more freedom, a life not controlled by fear, but actually distinguished by love and courage, then I would encourage you to hold out your hands and just ask, pray this prayer with me as we ask God to give us the courage. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have commanded us to not live from a place of fear, but to live from a place of courage. Lord, we know that your will is that we grow and that as we persevere, that we become mature and complete. And I just pray for every person here who is submitting to your will, to your way. I pray that you would envision them with, with, with a new plan. Behold, you say, you are doing a new thing. Lord, I pray that you would do a new thing in each of our hearts. And it will be a big thing. A big thing that will need courage. A big thing that will, might give us a, a sense of fear, but we're going to step into it anyway because we know that you are God, the creator and king of the universe. Jesus and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us to have courage to walk your way, to walk the way, and to follow you until until our life is ended, God, and to never stop moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.